English literature as the works of Chaucer, Shakespeare, Dickens, Wordsworth, Keats, and the hundreds of other poets, novelists, and dramatists of England. But behind these pages, and reflected in them, lies an island and its people, England itself. This is England, an old country that was producing great literature long before the new world was discovered. And this is London, England's greatest city, center of life and literature. Broadly speaking, we may say that much of the literature of England is reflected from three main areas or backgrounds. London itself, the clearing house of the world on the River Thames. The English countryside, a green landscape dotted with charming villages and historic towns. And finally, the sea, which surrounds England on all sides. All roads lead to London, home of English literature. Modern London, the largest city in the world, is very different from the medieval city where Geoffrey Chaucer lived and wrote. Yet the spirit of Chaucer's London and of London today are much the same. Hub of world trade, London has always been the pulsing, ageless symbol of England itself. When a man is tired of London, wrote Samuel Johnson, he is tired of life, for there is in London all that life can afford. A hundred and fifty years later, the same admiration was expressed by John Macefield. Oh, London town's a fine town, and London sights are rare. Here are some of the London sights you will read about in English literature. Tower Bridge, famous Big Ben, beautiful St. Paul's Cathedral. Buckingham Palace. And of course, Westminster Abbey. This is England's greatest literary shrine. Within its beautiful Gothic walls are buried Geoffrey Chaucer, Edmund Spencer, Lord Tennyson, Robert Browning, and the man in whose works you will read most about London, Charles Dickens. It is in Dickens' works that we get a vivid social picture of London. He knew every corner of the great city intimately, and his books are filled with London scenes and London characters. Winding through London, the River Thames has supplied inspiration to British writers for centuries. Swans float on the Thames as they did when Edmund Spencer described them. With that, I saw two swans of goodly hue come softly swimming down along the lee. Spencer saw in the Royal River a thing of lyric beauty. John Macefield, modern poet, saw the Thames as a highway carrying cargoes, a dirty British coaster with a cargo of tyne coal, road rails, pig lead, firewood, ironware, and cheap tin trays. Called the noblest river in Europe, the gentle Thames is symbolic of the stream of literature that is poured out of England into the world. The Houses of Parliament on the banks of the Thames are another symbol, a symbol of the English way of life. That way of life has been admirably expressed in the great speeches of Edmund Burke, William Pitt, and Winston Churchill. The English way of life is also expressed by the common man in London's Hyde Park. Freedom of the press and freedom of expression have been for generations an essential part of English life and English literature. From London, center of the national life and culture, roads reach out in all directions over the English countryside. In the old days, travel by horse-drawn coaches was slow and numerous inns along the way provided food and lodging. Names of many of the inns became very famous. You can read the names of more than 50 inns in Dickens' novel, Pickwick Papers. 
Today, modern transportation is a convenient aid in getting acquainted with literary landmarks of England. One of these is Tintagel Castle, birthplace of King Arthur, according to Tennyson's Idols of the King. Here at Glastonbury Abbey, some legends claim, King Arthur and Queen Guinevere are buried. York Minster is one of the many cathedrals that dot the map of England. Thou stately York, wrote William Wordsworth in his poem, Cathedrals. Looking at the towers of 600-year-old York, we can agree with the poet John Keats that a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Love of beauty is a dominant theme that runs through much of English literature. Beauty, particularly natural beauty, was the favorite subject of William Wordsworth. Come forth into the light of things, he wrote. Let nature be your teacher. And nature was the teacher of many English writers. Perhaps no people on earth have shown a greater love for their own land than have the English. England is a garden, said Kipling. Oh, to be in England now that April's there, wrote Robert Browning. No lovelier hills than thine, said Walter Delamere, have laid my tired thoughts to rest. The beauty of the countryside has inspired generations of English writers. Many of them, as Shakespeare did, found tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. Typical of the charming villages in the countryside is Stratford. Here in the parish church, Shakespeare is buried. The River Avon and the streets of Stratford are today much as they were when Will Shakespeare lived and wrote there. Of all the English countryside, the Lake District in Westmoreland County is exceptionally beautiful. This is the region near Grasmere where Wordsworth lived and wrote. Here he was inspired to write, I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. The themes of many of Wordsworth's poems were drawn from the rivers, woods, and lakes of his English countryside. Wordsworth is buried at Grasmere, in the heart of the region he loved. His contribution was a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting sun, and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit. In the minds of English writers, the sea has always been a significant symbol of England's position in the world. I must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea and the sky. Thus, John Macefield and many other writers used the sea as a theme. Samuel Coleridge used it in The Ancient Mariner, to Joseph Conrad, the sea was a thing of sweeping power and beauty. Conrad, himself the master of a ship, once wrote that the sea never changes and all its works are wrapped in mystery. The mystery and power of the sea also appealed to Kipling, who wrote, Who hath desired the sea, the sight of salt water unbounded? English life and literature have been molded by the sea. Lord Byron expressed the devotion of many English writers when he wrote, And I have loved thee, ocean. London, the English countryside, and the sea. These are three of the elements that have gone into the making of the literature of England. That literature can be better understood by understanding England itself. In one of his plays, Shakespeare has given us a literary picture of England. This royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, Demoparadise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, 
this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands, this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England.